This week's reading, <coughs> excuse my cough, is Does God Hide the Truth? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramhansa Yogananda. In last week's reading, we saw that the great masters themselves counseled discretion in the dissemination of truth. The counter-argument is sometimes made, but the Lord doesn't hide. He reveals his beauty in the sunsets, his tender sympathy in the rain, his wrath in the thunder, his restless energy in the brooks, his power in the sunlight. There are exoteric truths, and there are also esoteric truths. There is that which is revealed impersonally and left up to us to interpret, such as the thunder and our perception of it as God's wrath, the rain and our perception of it as God's sympathy. But even behind God's most open expressions, there lies impenetrable, impenetrable mystery. The wind blows where it wills, said Jesus in chapter 3 of the Gospel of St. John. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Sri Krishna says in the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, By me the whole vast universe of things is spread abroad. By me the unmanifest. In me are all existences contained, not I in them. God's hidden reality cannot be understood by the reasoning faculty. India's Shankya philosophy states frankly, Ishwar Ashidha, God is not provable. A willingness to seek the underlying reality behind appearances is essential for those who would know God. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. This is such a important topic that reason alone is not the faculty we need to perceive God's truth. And this is actually something I'd like to talk a little bit about because reason is such a powerful tool that can be used for good or not for good, for harm. And in, I'm not talking necessarily about big, broad good and harm, but just in our own lives. Reason can be used to confirm our intuitions, to test our sense of what is true. It can also be used to, uh, as the tool of doubt. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this because, of course, reason is touted as the, you know, tool par excellence of this age. Look at what we've accomplished through reason. In fact, you know, usually f through science is what people mean. Science is, you know, used reason to, to great benefit. And the previous age, even in history, was called the age of reason. And uh, Hegel came up with the philosophy, all that is real is rational. And all that is rational is real. And I was actually trained to be a scientist. That's what I um, <coughs> studied in school. And so I went into all of this, and, and to some extent I fell for it, that reason would be that which would get me everywhere I needed. But we can see, and what I want to talk about is that even according to its own system, reason recognizes its limitations. And the reason why I say that is because often when we have a doubt, we have to address a doubter, whether that doubter is living inside us, or whether that doubter is a well-meaning friend saying, well, you know, I think you did. Have you done due diligence? Have you explored all the options? I mean, we, there, reason has a certain force, especially when it's trying to ask us for answers that we can't readily supply, even if we still feel that, no, what we're experiencing is true. But reason, as anyone who practices science, for example, or mathematics knows, reason has 
vast limitations. Yogananda gives the example of inductive reasoning. That one crow is black, two crows are black, thousands of crows, millions of crows have been found to be black, therefore all crows are black. But they found white crows in Australia. This is the primary tool of biology and of science. If you do a test in a small enough case, then you can generalize it to everything. It's not always true. Similarly, deductive reasoning. If A is true, then B is true. And if B is true, then C is true. And we can get very far with this. But it all starts with if A is true. Is A true? And often, I don't know. If it were, we would have this whole long chain. And there is a specific example. You'll have to indulge me for a moment. My mathematical scars can't help but <laughs> slip out. But this is one that's known well to student high school, <coughs> excuse me, high school students. In high school geometry, that's the only subject in school that, that most of us get a chance to even explore what is a theorem, what is a proof, what is deductive reasoning in mathematics. Usually math is just more formula. But we actually get to prove theorems, usually much to the dismay of all the students, but still, that we can follow <coughs> a chain of logic and that from this theorem we can deduce other theorems. From this statement we can conclude other statements are true. But what about the first statement? The very first, the place where we begin can't be derived from anything else because then it's not the beginning. So in geometry those are called axioms or postulates. In fact they're called postulates because they're saying these are things we think are true. If you have two lines they intersect in one point. How can I prove it? I can't. Just draw it and let's just agree. So the whole foundation of this rat reasoning system is shaky at best and acknowledged to be shaky and it goes even farther because there is one postulate that says basically parallel lines never meet. We go, yeah, of course, draw them. They never meet. Look, drive down the road. There are the parallel lines. Thank God they don't, you know, just meet someday and close us off. And people tried, <coughs> because this was so self-evident, Euclid himself, who, you know, created this whole book on geometry, tried to prove the parallel postulate in terms of the others so he didn't have to accept it as given. He wanted to prove that it followed, and he couldn't. And many others tried and succeeded until there was a flaw that was found and, and that this actually has to just be assumed. And so then someone said, well, what if it isn't true? What if parallel lines do actually meet? And interestingly, for those of you who know, um, the first person to ask this question was Omar Khayyam. So what if parallel lines do actually meet? Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, parallel lines don't meet. Well, imagine a grid, right? You know, imagine I'm drawing a grid right here. And of course, the parallel lines don't meet. Now take that grid and wrap it around a ball, like the globe, when you look at a globe and you see the latitude and longitude lines. Well, of course, the lines start out parallel, but they seem to kind of shrink and close off and meet at the edges. And in fact, that is the geometry of vision. That is the way we perceive things. Science has concluded. Why? Because our eyes are round. So even according to its own system, reason has all kinds of limitations. It, has, it can't tell you what is true. Starting with something true, you can conclude other things that therefore must be true. But God's hidden truth can't be perceived with reason. Okay, so what can it be perceived with? What other tools do we have? What other faculties do we have besides reason? Well, of course, feeling. Because if we, for example, Swami Kriyananda gives the example of reason versus feeling in terms of feeling impelling us to act. If you know that over there on La Brea is the best restaurant in the world, and it serves the best, I actually liked Sante La Brea before they closed, but it serves the best health food and it's tasty and cheap and everything. And you know the chef and you know where he was born and you know how he and his wife started the whole thing. If you're not hungry, then you won't go. It is feeling that impels us to act. Now, obviously, feeling can be disturbed. Feeling can, you know, impel us to act wrongly. In fact, 
you know, I have had uh, rational discussions with someone who is committed to the fact that I was wrong. And so when every counter-argument that was given, when I gave another counter-argument that ended up, you know, disproving his point, he said, well, you're smarter than me, but I'm still right. <laughs> Master used the phrase, a person convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. That if we feel a certain way, then all of our logic follows that. Swami Kriyananda gives the example of when he, his feelings were slightly hurt because he wanted to see Yogananda, but Yogananda was busy. And so, <clears throat> pardon me. And so, he he. There was a job of you know bringing a water bottle up to Master's uh, room. And so, Swami brought it up and kind of put it in place and made just about as much noise as he could. <laughs> and and Yogananda continued dictating letters and writings and didn't pay any attention. And so Swami felt hurt. He came downstairs and he thought, well. That's all right. I mean, of course he's gonna, not going to notice me. And then he said, yeah, I mean, who even notices anybody in this cold, unfeeling world that we live in? He said, no, 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 of course, you know, he has many things he has to do. Why would he, you know, ever want to pay attention to me? That the reason follows that disturbed feeling. But then he said, I asked myself, do I want to feel this way? No. He said, what can I do about it? And so he said, he sat in meditation, he put his mind here strongly, and in five minutes the mood was gone. And that is one tool that we can use in our own lives to say, am I in this, I'm in this situation, I feel this unwillingness, do I like this feeling? If you can get yourself to say, no, I'd rather not feel this way, then okay, what can I do about it? And... I had an experience uh, of this recently. Uh, a few nights ago, um, I went over to the Earth Cafe on Melrose, right past La Cienega. And I drove in to park my car, and it was really crowded. But I thought, oh, look, here's a spot. And it's construction. And the, the construction thing says, no parking ever, <laughs> except after 7 p.m. So it was like, OK, great. So I park here. I notice there's a lot of space around, but I'm parking in this spot, which no one grabbed. <laughs> Lucky me. I went in, then I stepped out to make a phone call, and I see someone. <laughs> and I, oh God, so I run up, oh, hi officer, sorry, this is my car, and is everything okay? He said, can't park here. I said, no, but the sign says <laughs> after seven. And he said, did you see the other sign? <laughs> that says, no parking, 24 hours, permit only? I said, no, but the sign is there, and I'm not past it yet. He said, did you see the sign before your car? And I went into, am I going to, I said, I'm, I'm happy to move my car. He said, I've already started the citation, sir. So in that moment, I thought, well, what can I do? I can't do anything. So I can say, ah, but, you know, he's kind of well-built guy. And so I just said, Nothing I can do about it. I still have to, pro have to solve the problem of where to park my car. So I said, well, sir, officer, where can I park my car? He said, well, I've already written you the ticket, so you can just leave it here. <laughs> I said, okay. So, you know, $58 is a bit high for a parking charge, but still, I mean... It works out, so I might as well enjoy the rest of dinner, and so, so I did. So this, this other quote from the reading, that a willingness to see the hidden reality behind appearances is essential for those who would know God. That willingness, you all have, we all have. <coughs> if we didn't, we wouldn't be here on Sunday. I mean, there are many other things you could do with a Sunday morning. That willingness is what brings us all here, makes us interested in these things. Um, speaking of, of what you could do otherwise on a Sunday, in, my wife and I were India, in India for three and a half years, and we were teaching yoga and meditation there as part of Ananda's work there. And there was a, a class that we were giving on a Sunday morning, on a Sunday morning, Saturday, maybe Saturday morning. And... It was a Raja Yoga class, just like the Raja Yoga series is here that Durga and Brooke are doing. And um, 
we had a, a student who was coming regularly, and then one morning he came in and he was smiling very broadly, and then we meditated and we were very happy for him, and then you know we didn't know exactly what was going on, but then somehow we talked about <coughs> what about miracles in your lives, and he said, well I have something I'd like to share. He said this morning, Saturday morning, we had to have parent-teacher conferences at my kid's school, and so I went to the school. And I, there was a long line, and it's basically, you know, you show up and they, what's your kid, and then let's talk, and then next. And so, so I was really concerned, and so I said to the guy in front of me, "Would you yoga class, Janahe?" Which means I have to go to a yo, I need to go to a yoga class. And the guy said, "Yoga class, tike," and. And then he let him go ahead of him. And then, in fact, everyone else, he said, yoga class, yo- yoga class, yoga class. And they said, oh. And they let him go to the front of the line. And so he wasn't late. It's one of the reasons I love India. So, so again, that willingness... That interest, even in India, those people were respecting. He has the willingness. Let's encourage that. And we should do that with ourselves. Now, this brings up the question of what if a friend of ours doesn't have that willingness? Because this happens all the time, especially when we're first getting on the path. It's like, look, I discovered vegetarianism. Let's all be vegetarians. Yes! And it's like, I discovered, you know, this particular exercise. Let's do that. Yes, I discovered chiropractic. Oh, good. I discovered God and the path. Let's all be on the spiritual path. Not all of our friends will come along with us. I was shocked to discover that. Like, no, but this is where we've been going this whole time. This is not where I've been going. <laughs> and I was, it really took, <clears throat> took me a while to try to understand that. It's that there is a seed planted in us, and each one of us, and my friends too. But it has to come in its own time and in its own way. And everyone has that right to have the freedom to let it come in its own time, in its own way. But until that time, when that willingness isn't there, it does not do us much good (coughs) to force the person. How can you force willingness? You can't force willingness. It's a contradiction in terms. So we can pray for those people. We can bless them. We can always have the door open mentally and otherwise. But why should we not force them? As the topic last week said, it's not, we shouldn't try to put spiritual truths on people for their own sake because it does them harm. How could it do them harm? Because it's simple. A friend of mine uh, had a, a certain spiritual background forced on him as a kid and he hated it. And so then when I said, read Autobiography of a Yogi, he said, you know, I did that religion thing. I saw how people seemed nice but were fake. And maybe you have to go through that and learn it yourself. That when things are pushed on us at the wrong time, then when it comes up again, we say, yeah, yeah, I heard that. So we have to be very careful in that. And what is our intention? Is If I'm trying to push something on someone, is it their need to hear it or is it my need to say it? And if it's my need to say it, then maybe I better just maybe say it to the wind or <laughs> say it somewhere. But... Don't do that. It's very helpful. And that was something early on for me. Because, of course, when we get on the path, we're very enthusiastic. But it's because of that willingness. Now, where does that willingness come from? Okay, we have this seed of willingness. How did we get it? Well, sometimes we're born into it. There are a few families of yogis we happen to know um, that all incarnate together and all take Kriya Yoga together. And it's just beautiful and exceedingly rare. And many of us are trying not to be jealous, like, whoa, that was not my experience growing up. Um, Usually we get that (coughs) that willingness by suffering. That that's 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 certainly how it happened to me. Without going into the whole long story, I basically hit a wall that and that was blindsided by suffering on something that I totally didn't see coming. And I said, well. My logical, rational system that I was developing as a mathematician trying to apply it to life is definitely flawed because 
I didn't see that truck, so to speak, <laughs> knocking me over. I've got to find out what is really running this world. So, <coughs> excuse me. In this way, we can be grateful for suffering because it is that goad. It is pushing us where we ourselves want to go. Now, this is all fine, but we're already on the path. So how do we sort of apply this willingness to ourselves? Because now that we have that willingness, we are 100% willing all the time. Uh, not necessarily. <laughs> so how do we work with ourselves in those moments of unwillingness? Well, there's the small unwillingness. Like, do I enjoy feeling unwilling and contracted and small and no, I won't do it? If not, okay, I don't really enjoy this. So... Is there anything I can do about this situation? No, I might as well get on with it. There was a monk at, Mount, at uh, Lake Shrine who was having to water the land. This is when they first bought the property and they were planting all the grass and things there. And his job was to water the, just wet, <coughs> excuse me, wet down the ground. And it was so difficult, sloshing in mud, falling all the time, flies and mosquitoes everywhere, just yuck. Plus the water was cold, it was cold weather then. And so... Every morning he woke up, oh, I hope that <coughs> Reverend Stanley, who was in charge, doesn't give me that job. Ugh! And every morning he would get that job and just hate it more and more. And then one day he finally said, I hope, well, I bet he's going to give me that job. What does it matter? Nothing I can do about it. Fine, I'm looking forward to it. And then that day he wasn't assigned that job and he was never assigned that job again. And that's sometimes what Divine Mother puts us through. She puts us through a dry run where she says, okay, you're going to have to do this horrible thing. What do you think? And you go, <laughs> and if, you, if we can <coughs> say, okay, then sometimes she says, just kidding. <laughs> it's what we call a dry run. You know? But we can't, we can't say, well, if I say yes, then do I not have to do it? I mean, we, that willingness has to be real. So that's the small one. Well, what about the medium ones? Well... Um, this suffering brings us to willingness and it seems like a really raw deal that we have to suffer Yogananda argued with God he said that why should, you don't have to suffer God you're always happy why do you put your suffering on us we didn't ask to be created and, and he said God's response is I'm bringing them all back to me so when Yogananda quoted that I mean, sorry, before I get to the quote, that this suffering really comes from us wanting something that actually isn't good for us, though, by all appearances, we think it is, and this is what we must have. And, but Divine Mother's saying, you actually don't want that. It's not that I'm telling you not to have it, it's that you and your higher self don't want this. And so I'm going to help you. There's a quote, uh, Yogananda read this poem, The Hound of Heaven, he recorded it, by Francis Thompson. And there's a beautiful <coughs> passage in there where Divine Mother says to the devotee, All that I took from you, I didst but take, not for thy harms, but just so thou mightest seek it in my arms. All that thy child's mistake fancies as lost, I have stored for thee at home. Rise, clasp my hand and come. So, if we can't use reason to detect the truth, how do we? Well, I talked about feeling in terms of feeling can go in the direction of emotion, but it can also go in the direction of intuition. Calm feeling becomes intuition. When we have an intuition, we just know. There's no reason, there's no logic, there's no justification, we just know. Somebody call, the phone rings, you know who it is without looking at it. You know who it is, you pick it up, and you know it's them. Or you have a sense of danger, or you have a sense of success. Certain things, intuition brings complete confidence because you know it's true. And Yogananda defined intuition as the soul's power of knowing God. Each one of us has that power to know God, that intuition. So how do we develop our intuition? Well, 
we have intuitions all the time and sometimes we're not listening. I know it's true for me that I'll hear a little voice say, well, why don't you do this one? And for example, as I was packing for this trip, I need two <coughs> of these shirts. Why don't you pack three? And I was tempted, as I often do, to go, I don't need three, I need two. <laughs> but I thought, you know what, just because the topic is intuition, I'm going to practice listening to my intuition in the small things where it doesn't really matter. So I said, ah, what is it? I'll pack three. And as you probably can fill in the dots, Darmini had the rest of my clothes that she was going to be driving down that she didn't have. So it was a good thing that I had that extra shirt. And in fact, Jaya brought me some extra shirts from India, of all places we happened to meet here. So there was a lot, that little things, follow your intuition in little things, were harmless things. Ask for intuition. I'm going to pick which salad I want to eat. Which salad should I have? Ask. And follow it and see what happens. It isn't that you'll eat the salad and then, oh, you know, that's... But in little ways, we trust ourselves, so then we can trust ourselves in the big ways. And finally, intuition is best developed in the silence after meditating. Yogananda said, every time you meditate, practicing a technique, and then put the technique aside and sit, that is when your intuition strengthens. Intuition is a muscle. It gets strengthened by using it. It isn't that some people are intuitive and some people aren't. We're all intuitive. And the more we <coughs> use that intuition, the stronger it gets. I wanted to make one last comment about this reading because Jesus says in the Gospel, the wind blows where it wills. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it has come from or where it is going. Such is everyone born of spirit. And often that's interpreted correctly as when you have a, an avatar, an incarnation of God, a saint in front of you, you don't really know where he's come from and where he's going. But it's true of all of us, because all of us are born in spirit, born of the spirit. Why don't we know where we've come from? We've had many lives before. Arjuna says to, or Krishna says to Arjuna, you and I have lived many times. I remember all my lifetimes, but you do not. Why don't we remember those lies? Master said very simply, because we would only remember the bad. We would just focus on the bad. He said, if you, have, if you died of cancer in one life and then you got a little boil on your hand in this life, you would say, oh my God, it's cancer. All that fear would come back. He said, we focus on the bad, and we shouldn't. He said, if you have a friend, and that friend has done many good things, that person is a very good person, but if they do one bad thing, strongly bad against you, then you say the person is bad. Master said, <coughs> if you have a piano and one key is bad, the whole piano isn't bad, just fix the key. And the piano is fine. He said, I don't like it when people say that person is bad. He said, there is much good in that person. Both if we're on the receiving end or if we're on the giving end, we should remember that. But most of all, trying to uncover God's truths through reason, Master described as visiting a garden and trying to understand every flower and every <coughs> bird and every butterfly with a microscope, I mean, or with a magnifying glass and with maybe a book looking them up. He said, why bother? He said, go meet the Lord of the garden, the Lord of the castle. Befriend him, and then he will show you everything. In place of our usual whispers reading, I wanted to read a, the words to a song that Swami Kriyananda wrote. Uh, he actually finished writing this, the words to the song yesterday. The song is called, Through a Long and Lonely Night. Through a long and lonely night, I've whispered your name. Through the pains and joys of life, I'm always the same. Tempt me no longer, this world's not for me. I have known all its charms. Fold me now in your arms, make me free. Lifetimes have passed. I've called out to you through hope and despair. 
Lifetimes I've known the goals that I sought awaited nowhere. Help me remember there's one goal alone. All I am is yours. All I've done is yours. I'm your own. Remain pursued.